Okay, well, th thank you uh, so much uh, for inviting me, and Rand, thank you for that wonderful talk, and, and that, oh, yes, the wall will come down, and, and a lot of walls uh, do have to come down, and uh, to my shame, this is the first time I've ever been inside of this building, and as my Yiddish mama would say, uh, it's a machaya, and uh, it, is, it is great to be here. Um, when I was watching this presentation that Rand gave, it reminded me of the many forms of apartheid we have uh, here on Turtle Island um, in Canada. Uh, the fact that th those endless border stops are the stops that are experienced by young black men largely uh, in this community as well. And as we know, there's a carding system that basically if you are an adult black man in this city over the age of 12, uh, you've got a file in, in the computer system if you are Arab you likely have been stopped uh, for walking while Arab, driving while Arab, flying while Arab, or breathing while Arab. Um, and we have uh, also, when we were talking about the medical care, um, look at what's going on in Attawapiskat right now. What's going on in Pimichikamac? Uh, all of these communities. Earlier this year, I'm not sure how many of you knew, um, uh, a man named Norman Schwabek, uh in the uh, Anishinaabeaske territory uh, north of Thunder Bay, his wife died last fall because the local health station did not have enough oxygen. Can you imagine not having enough? And, and we're talking again. This is one of the most wealthy countries on the planet. And he made a promise to his wife on her deathbed that he would bring back oxygen. So in February, he walked almost a thousand kilometers from Thunder Bay up to his home community, uh, dragging a full oxygen tank. And he made that promise to his wife and he fulfilled it saying, uh, I will make sure that there will always be oxygen um, in our health center. And I bring up this example of the way in which we have apartheid here and because it's very much linked to militarism and global military spending because to maintain apartheid, we have to use extreme levels of violence. And where I come from uh, now, I, I lived in Toronto for 25 years, I now live in Perth, which is an hour south of Ottawa in a traditional unceded Algonquin territory. Our community is celebrating its 200th anniversary. And what's remarkable about the 200th anniversary is the number of articles appearing in the local paper talking about those brave Scottish and Irish immigrants who came through those horrible wilds and settled and how on earth did they get there? And what they don't mention in all these articles is the fact that there were people there in the uh, previous 8,000 years who were there to welcome them and to help them get through those winters. And so Perth is celebrating its anniversary with 200 events, but not one of them is in, dedicated to an indigenous theme or story. And so whether that is inadvertent or intentional, the result is the same in as much as the Algonquin people are disappeared in much the same way that the Israelis want to disappear Palestinians as a people and their history. That is why street names are changed. That is why houses are demolished. And this idea that the desert suddenly bloomed, <laughs> well, we can get into that another time. But nonetheless, these issues are all very much connected. And where, where I live in Perth, which is kind of eastern Ontario, the Ottawa Valley, the Algonquin are people of the Ottawa River Valley uh, watershed. And their lives were dramatically affected by the Napoleonic Wars. Because at the time of the Napoleonic Wars, the uh, white pine was so incredibly valuable, they didn't have enough in Europe to build their navies, uh, to wage their wars, and so they basically decimated whole territories in eastern Ontario, massive displacement of the, the traditional Algonquin people there to fight a war of colonialism, colonialism abroad. And we have seen throughout our occupation of Turtle Island that traditional indigenous lands, first and foremost, we take them, and we make all kinds of uses out of them. We take the resources out of them, uh, or we get the uh, indigenous people to go in and mine them, uh, but we don't give them protective equipment. So if we look at the uranium that was used to make the nuclear weapons that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that came from the Northwest Territories and from Saskatchewan uh, uranium mines by the Dene, who had no protective equipment and who died as a result afterwards because the uranium got into their lungs uh, and so they died of cancer. And to this day, there are all kinds of cancers associated with the uranium mining, which continues to fuel 
the nuclear arms race. What nuclear arms race, you ask? I thought we settled that one in the 80s. Well, no. Obama, uh, who just held, ironically, a nuclear protection summit because he says we don't want those nuclear weapons to get into the hands of the, the wrong people. Um, I, it would seem to me no one should have these in the first place, and the only people who have ever used these bombs directly are the Americans, and the only people who have used depleted uranium weapons are NATO powers. Uh, and so we spread cancer around the globe in, in this manner. And Obama has committed to $1 trillion in a nuclear modernization program. So this garbage that Trudeau was there to you know, uh, look good and, and smile for the cameras and say he's a feminist and all the rest of it while he's selling uh, uh, $15 billion of weapons to the Saudi regime, which is basically arming misogyny, an interesting position for a feminist to take. Um, what has happened is uh, Canada violates the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty by continuing to export, being one of the world's largest exporters of uranium, and who is one of our biggest clients but the United States. And we cannot monitor or track where that uranium goes, but guess where it goes. We know where it goes. It goes first and foremost into the nuclear weapons stockpile because these things need to cannibalize each other because after a while the tritium starts to run low and the tritium is the trigger device in the nuclear weapon and so they need more tritium who produces the world's majority of tritium the can do reactors that are here in canada as well so canada is also a war testing ground so those of you who remember the uh the, the nuclear weapons testing in the 1980s that was brought to you courtesy of uh, pierre elliott trudeau uh, a liberal government um, he brought a cruise missile to Canada. Uh, the brain for the cruise missile was built at Lytton Industries uh, here in Toronto. And the, the cruise missile, when it was tested, would land in traditional indigenous territories in Cold Lake, Alberta as well. Uh, there was Wollaston Lake at that time where there was uranium mining going on. There was a huge encampment in the 80s. Uh, when it came time to bomb Iraq in 1991, uh, a lot of the bombers who flew over Iraq where did they train? They trained over the Tassinan, which we call Newfoundland, Labrador, and Quebec, uh, especially near Happy Valley Goose Bay at the Canadian Forces Base there. That's where those CF-18s and the other British pilots and the French pilots would come to train 15,000 overflights of the Innu on an annual basis completely disrupted their way of life. They were dropping 1,000-pound dummy bombs uh, while folks were out in the bush. And the way in which this base was advertised to NATO powers is, come here because nobody lives there. And we know about Terra Nullis, uh, the, and the Pope is, is, has got to uh, get rid of that uh, concept. But uh, nonetheless, that is how we have always treated indigenous lands, that there's nobody here, and if they are here, they become incredibly inconvenient and we demonize them and turn them into an enemy. Now, in terms of talking about militarism, Canada today spent $67 million on war directly. That's how much we spend on a daily basis in this country, $67 million. If you actually translated that into what $67 million would spend on, let's say, university tuition, 3,000 uh, university students could go to school for free for four years. 3,000. So if we didn't spend anything on war for a month, 120,000 students would not have to be working the midnight shift at McDonald's, getting stressed out, uh, doing drugs to wake up in the morning, doing drugs to go to sleep at night, because they're not getting enough sleep in their formative teenage years. That's how much money Canada is spending on war. Uh, you can look at 1,600 subsidized for a year day, daycare spaces that could be created with that $67 million, 1,200 affordable housing units. So in Homes Not Bombs, our message has always been clear from the very start, and that message is Canada needs to convert to a peacetime economy. But the biggest obstacle that we face in conversion or transformation to that economy is our own enslavement to a mythology that goes back to our colonial roots that we are here as a benevolent people and in the same way that we were being benevolent when we ran the first North American rendition to torture program which was called residential schools we kidnapped indigenous children and took them away from their parents because their parents were seen as a bad influence on them, put them into these residential schools which were run by the Catholic Church, the United Church, and the Anglican Church, and the Jesuits, and the federal government with a very specific 
purpose. Get the Indian out of that human being. And we know from the Truth and Reconciliation Report of the thousands who were killed, the thousands who were tortured. I was watching a video today of female Israeli soldiers who are refuseniks. Uh, they refuse to serve in the occupation forces. And they were talking about being in the forces and how part of the training, they, they put the cigarettes out on Palestinian kids. Well, that's what we did in residential schools to indigenous children as well. But we don't talk about this because Canada, like Franco's post-dictatorship Spain, is basically a country that exists under something what the Spanish called the Pact of Forgetting. When Franco basically acceded to democratic transition in Spain, it was based on a key agreement. The Pact of Forgetting said, we will not look at the crimes of the last 40 years and you can have your democracy. So nobody gets charged, nobody gets put on trial, nobody is held to account for the hundreds of thousands of people who were killed by Franco, who were tortured, and who lived with the legacy of that horrible dictatorship. And in Canada, we have a very similar Pact of Forgetting. And the Pact of Forgetting says, you are welcome to live in Canadian society as long as you buy into the mythology of Canada the good. Canada has something to share that's wonderful with the world. And I think that transforming that is about transforming the knowledge uh, and the language that we have about our own history. So, for example, I was reading in the Globe and Mail today an editorial by the head of Project Plowshares. He's a good guy, you know, he does a lot of fantastic research. And he said that Canada's sale of $15 billion worth of armored brigade vehicles, which will be armed with Gatling gun machine guns on the top. So what are those going to be used for? They're going to be used in Yemen. They're going to be used to repress their own population. He said that this harmed Canada's credibility as a voice for human rights. Mm. <laughs> and I had to stop and think, we're still saying that, aren't we? Because imagine being a kid in Attawapiskat reading that editorial and wondering what reputation for human rights. Canada's never had a reputation for human rights other than in our own press releases. And when you start to believe your press releases, you are very dangerous ground. We have in this country, well, let me ask you this. How many of you would feel comfortable attending something called the Hitler School of Human Rights? I think a lot of us would say, well, that, that's not appropriate. But we have something called the Pearson School of Peace Building. And, you, well, Lester Pearson, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. But he's also someone who, if you look at the historical record, could qualify as someone who would wind up in a war criminal trial. In fact, Noam Chomsky calls Toronto's airport War Criminal International Airport because... <laughs> When Pearson was Prime Minister, he did so much work to facilitate the genocide which was taking place in Southeast Asia. And there are many uh, studies about this. Uh, uh, Victor Levant has done a fantastic study called Quiet Complicity. A look at how Canadians, our economy in the 1960s and 70s, literally was booming because of the war exports. We were producing and exporting Agent Orange. We were exporting napalm. We were making here at Lytton, again, cluster bombs, which were used to blow up and obliterate human beings in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Um, and we also had people who were on the International Control Commission who were supposed to be UN mandated to be peaceably observing what was going on in Vietnam. They would come back from Vietnam and be debriefed at a place called Langley, Virginia. You know what's there? It's the CIA. Um, and they would share targeting information which would then be given to the United States Air Force and the B-52 bombers. That was what Pearson was doing, but we name a, um, a uh, peace building school after him. So I think um, when we look at militarization and military spending and Canada the good, we need to look at it in a broader context of why do we have this military in the first place. And that's why I'm so glad to be here tonight because it is connected to our support for the occupation of Palestine. It is connected to climate change because what is going to be used against the frontline climate change resistors and what is currently being used against those who are fleeing the effects of climate change, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, you try and cross the Mediterranean, there's a Canadian warship right there 
along with other NATO warships to interdict you and to turn you back against international law. You are not supposed to prevent refugees from seeking access to safe haven, but that is what we are doing. So if we were to actually look at what Trudeau wants to now do with the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, Mr. Hajan, uh, uh, the new war minister, and let's call that a war minister because Canada has never needed to be defended against anybody except for its own population. Um, and as a result of that, we see the deployment of Canadian troops against Canadian people and especially against Indigenous people throughout our history. The Canadian military is an organization that a former Supreme Court justice found last year was rife with an epidemic of sexual violence against women. And so we wonder why we train these guys to kill and then we send them overseas on so-called peace missions and then we wonder why the UN suppresses reports that show that Canadian soldiers among many other soldiers may well be implicated in sexual abuse against children overseas. There was a report that came out just last week in which we learned that Canadian forces literally were looking the other way in Afghanistan when our allies, the people we were holding up in Afghanistan, were literally kidnapping young boys and raping them. Uh, just behind the wall. Those were the people that we were so-called training. So what kind of values are we Im uh, importing to people? Now, let, let me, I just want to share with you, um, you know, we all remember Rick Hillier saying, you know, the purpose of Canadian forces is to kill. Here's Lewis Mackenzie, another uh, Canadian general who said, as much as Canadians would like to ignore the fact, the role of a soldier is to kill as efficiently as possible with the resources available once he's ordered to do so by his government. There are many sidelines to his profession that make us all feel warm and fuzzy, such as the distribution of teddy bears and flood work, but they are all subordinate to one overriding responsibility, and that is to kill on demand. Now, currently, you know, the Liberal government has the highest approval rating of any government since they've started looking at this, which is remarkable uh, because we live in a democratic society and what that shows us is that the Canadian mass media is not doing its job. They are not asking enough questions and they are not being critical because they're reliving Trudeau mania and it's quite nauseating. Um, but one of the people who is a liberal senator, well he's no longer a liberal senator because we got rid of liberal senators, but Art Eagleton, who himself is a former war minister, some of us have occupied his offices before and, and been arrested there, um, he said this in 1999 uh, when we were bombing the people of Yugoslavia. If the cause is just and allies are willing, Canada will go to war again for humanitarian reasons even if the action defies international law and the United Nations Charter. Give that man a senatorial appointment. Um, now, the month he said that, the Globe and Mail reported that during the bombing of Yugoslavia, the government acknowledged that 28% of its laser-guided smart bombs missed their targets. That means 100 of the 361 laser-guided bombs exploded somewhere other than on a military target. What is anything other than a military target? We are talking hospitals, we are talking refugee caravans, we are talking farmers, we are talking civilians walking in the countryside. Uh, and Art Eggleton is an honorable senator. This is why I never use the term uh, honorable. Now, I just wanted to share with you, if I, if I could, just for a few minutes, um, some information about enemies. Because we have, now that we have these um, military uh, organizations, we have them for a reason. And the reason is this. In 1948, George Kennan, who was considered one of the liberals of uh, the United States establishment, he was a former ambassador to the Soviet Union. Some of you might have uh, heard uh, this quote before, but it bears repeating because this is how Canada and the United States and, and Western Europe run. He wrote in 1948, so this is after the victory against fascism, it's going to be a new world, blah, blah, blah. We have about 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of its population. And in this situation, we cannot help but be the object of envy and resentment. What do we do about this? Our real task in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity without detriment to our national security. So this is the policy document that is guiding the post-war democracies, which is basically, we've got all of this, 
and we're only this number of people and we not need to figure out how we can keep it all, not only keep it all, but expand it all without it harming our effective uh, our national security. To do this, we have to dispose with all sentimentality and daydreaming. Our attention will have to be concentrated everywhere on our immediate national objectives. We need not deceive ourselves that we can afford today the luxury of altruism and world benefaction. Let's not deceive ourselves. Why should we have that stuff? It's no good for us if we are talking about straight power. We should cease to talk about vague and, quote, for the Far East, unreal objectives such as human rights, the raising of the living standards, and democratization. How racist can it get? Uh, and so basically, he says, the day is not far off when we're going to have to deal in straight power concepts. The less we are hampered by idealistic slogans, the better. So on the one hand, you have the United Nations forming, and we're talking about sovereignty, we're talking about universal declarations of human rights, but this is all a facade, because the United Nations is run by the United Nations Security Council, which are the five most powerful nations on the planet, and if anything's going to get in our way, we're not going to do anything. So whether we're talking about Palestine, whether we're talking about Vietnam, whether we're talking about the governments that were overthrowing in Guatemala in 1954, in Iraq in, in the 50s, in Greece, installing coups uh, in Chile, all through Latin America, all across Asia, overthrowing democratically elected governments in countries like Indonesia, we shouldn't be idealistic about it because it's about what we have in keeping everybody else from having a piece of the pie. Now, in order to do this and to maintain these vast amounts of spending, we have to convince you, the Canadian public and the American public, that there is a threat. And the wonderful thing, especially about history, when you actually go through the documents, is how honest we actually are about what we're doing. In 1944, the head of GE, who was also uh, went on to become a major procurement uh, officer for the Pentagon, Charles Wilson, he said that he was very concerned that unless we called for a permanent war economy in 1944, uh, and we and disarmament might become a theme that people will really pick up on, and that this could be a very dangerous thing. And so basically, he said in 1944, the revulsion against war will not too long hence be almost incomparable for us to overcome in establishing a preparedness program. And for that reason, I'm convinced we must begin now to set the machinery in motion. What machinery is he talking about? Well, he spoke in front of a whole group of newspaper publishers and he said this, your job as the mass media is to convince the free world that we are in mortal danger. If the people were not convinced of it, it would be impossible for Congress to vote the vast sums now being spent to avert that danger. But with the support of public opinion, as marshaled by the press, we are off to a good start. The mobilization job cannot be completed unless such support is continuous. It is our job, yours and mine, to keep our people convinced that the only way to keep disaster from our shores is to build America's might. And of course, GE, whose slogan was, we bring big good things to life, became the largest manufacturer of nuclear weapons uh, in the United States. Now, who is our enemy and what kinds of things are we doing? Our enemy right now is terrorism. I'd like to read for you a very brief quote about terrorism. Will our technology allow us to fit 70 tons of lethality into a 20 ton package? Isn't that a scary concept? We want to take all of this massive killing power and put it into something you can put in a suitcase. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Doesn't that sound like Al-Qaeda and dirty bombs and, and all the rest? Well, no, that's a Canadian government military strategy from a place called the Defense Research Establishment Ottawa. Uh, and that is our Star Wars contribution. Murray Lumley played the Tin Man. Marie, uh, Romaine here was uh, Dorothy from Etobicoke. When we went to DRIO in uh, the fall of 2001 to say, if you want to stop terrorism, you've got to stop committing it. Um, and you've got to stop contributing to it. And when you're trying to put all that lethality into these small packages, that is terrorism. How is it that we um, maintain the military? Well, we maintain the military by creating enemies. So I wanted to share with you something from the Canadian forces, again, the good guys. The National Counterintelligence Unit produced a report recently 
um, on uh, threat information collection. And it's a secret document which has been very redacted. So you'll see there's, there's very little on most of the pages. It's whited out instead of blacked out because it's a very white supremacist document. Um, and you go through it, it's secret, it's secret. And then we begin to find out, okay, who poses a threat? Well, under terrorism, they talk about ISIL uh, or ISIS or Daesh. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff whited out uh, in keeping with white supremacy. Then we get to subversion. Aquasasne First Nation is under subversion. Then there's a whole bunch more of white supremacist white out. Then we have interference, extremism, civil unrest. It's a blank page except for one line. 14th and 15th of February has become a day to hold peaceful rallies and vigils to draw attention to violence against women in some cases, specifically violence against Aboriginal women. So those vigils about missing and murdered Indigenous women are the subject of a Canadian Forces Counterintelligence Anti-Terrorism Surveillance Operation. We are the enemy because we represent democracy. Some of you are familiar with something called the Trilateral Commission, which was formed in the early 1970s. The Trilateral Commission included quite a few Trudeau government ministers, as, as well as uh, Henry Kissinger and the Rockefellers. And they produced a report in 1973 called the Crisis of Democracy. And the crisis of democracy was that the people who were involved in social movements in the 1960s and 70s were infected with a virus. We had too much democracy and we were taking it too seriously. And so the crisis of democracy was not a crisis for us, it was a crisis for the world elites. And so the goal of the trilateralists ever since has been to take back that sense of empowerment, to disempower people, to create economic austerity, and to get rid of the concept of hope. Meanwhile, here in Canada, the enemy du jour is Muslims. And I wanted to share with you the Toronto Star, which is our nice local liberal uh, paper. They, they consider themselves the, the paper of the underdog. And this was a headline a few years back, taking cover. Fashion designers inspired by dour headlines are turning their backs on overt sexuality. Now, I, I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of dour, eh? So we don't want women to be looking like this uh, all the time, you know, like they look in the Calvin Klein ads. There's something wrong going on. Who's causing women to no longer look like this in advertisements? Could be Muslims. And what we find out is that unlike sexually charged trends of the past that brazenly expose women's legs, breasts, and midriffs with controversial names like heroin chic and porn style, this new approach has a solemnity, the Muslimization of fashion. And so Something, so again, we see that patriarchy is freaking out on a number of levels, whether it's murdered and missing women, many of whom have been murdered and missing because of the RCMP and police forces across the country, and also because of our patriarchy, and all of a sudden women wearing a hijab or simply not walking around in bikinis like their Playboy models um, uh, are suddenly a threat. This, is, this, this comes from uh, 2006. 2006. Now, uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, actually three years earlier, in March of 2003, just before we are about to invade Iraq for Iraq War III, because if you include the sanctions as Iraq War II and Iraq War I, blah, 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 uh, the, what's the biggest threat? Writers attack Islamism. So a manifesto is uh, going after the new totalitarianism. The new totalitarianism is not George Bush wake, making up weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It is Muslims. Now, you go again to the Toronto Star later that summer. Two kids, two cars, one cat, meet Canada's average family. Happy white folks. Happy white folks. Now, does this look like the representative face of Toronto, which is the United Nations of Canada? The same year, census information was uh, a front page headline by the Globe and Mail. And the Globe and Mail was concerned about the fact that increasingly our new numbers are coming from immigrants. And there was a front page headline, which unfortunately I couldn't find, but the headline says, how Canadian are you? There's a picture of a woman from Japan and a picture of a man from Pakistan. Can you imagine walking past that newspaper box in the morning and wondering, yeah, how Canadian are you? Because when you ask that question, 
you are putting into people's minds that there's something amiss about these folks. How about this one? Chilling bomb plot alleged. Underneath, census reveals South Asians flourishing in GTA. A little bit of editing would have helped there because when you see chilling bomb plot, and again you see South Asians, you, you, you make that connection, that there's a connection between Muslims and violence and terrorism. It's an enemy. We need the Canadian military to protect ourselves against our, these, these enemies. Globe and Mail. Will he assimilate? Should he assimilate? By 2030, 30% of us will be foreign born. But the reality of multiculturalism remains complex and volatile. Will it sustain us or separate us? Join us as we launch an eight week debate. And there's the little boy, should he assimilate, will he assimilate? Mm -hmm. Now the Toronto, and, and I like to use the Toronto Star as an example because the Toronto Star puts itself out there as the hero because we covered Omar Khadr's case and whatnot. Well, Michelle Shepard, does an interview with uh, Bin Laden's former bodyguard. And the headline says, Bin Laden didn't target civilians, he hit targets. Civilians happened to be around. And underneath, Michelle writes, well, uh, this guy is a star graduate of Yemen's rehab program for terrorists. Sound rehabilitated to you? Well, it sounds a lot like the guy who justified the bombing of the medical hospital in Afghanistan who said, well, they, we didn't know that there'd be people inside. You know, it's just a hospital. And Gaza. And Gaza, yes, which, which happens all the time. Um, and why does this happen? Here's the Canadian Marketing Hall of Fame. Uh, and these are all the recent inductees into the Marketing Hall of Fame. And apart from two women, it's a bunch of good old white boys. Um, because they are the ones who shape this imagery. Now, who are our enemies? Some of you know my friend Hassan Alri. He's your friend too. Hassan uh, was an enemy uh, under security certificate. He was held under secret information and allegations, which we found out later was an informant who had lied. CSIS knew about this in 2004, and yet he spent seven years in solitary confinement here in Canada, suffering under threat of deportation to Syria of all places. Now, he was prepared to be deported to Syria in October of 2003. He was fighting that deportation. This was when Meher Arar came back from Syria and said, this is what happened to me. So what happens? Well, we have in external affairs something called the Human Rights, Humanitarian Affairs, and International Women's Equality Division. They're the ones who handle the deportations to torture memos and um, because they deal with human rights. Um, and what, basically what they found in this confidential redacted document is this. Uh, we have some issues around uh, deporting Hassan uh, because he currently does not meet the threshold for criminal charges to be laid against him in Canada. It's also our understanding that there are no outstanding charges against him internationally or any other options for removal to a third country. And so they're trying to figure out what can we do? Can we deport him and get away with it? The response from the Human Rights Division of Global Affairs, which is approving the uh, export of Saudi vehicles, we will prepare the minister with required Q&As and media lines, and CIC will be the lead department. I want to share with you as well some of our other enemies and how easy it is to create enemies. 13 years ago this summer, we terrorized 25 young South Asian men whose name happened to be Mohammed in something called Project Threadbare. Oh, Project Thread, the RCMP called it. We called it Project Thread. And I want to share with you what some of the evidence, quote unquote, was to not only break down their doors in the middle of the night, put machine guns in their faces, call them effing terrorists, put them out at Maplehurst in solitary confinement, and get them to sign documents saying, I will not go through a pre-removal risk assessment, I'll go back to Pakistan, even though I'll have this terrorism label on my head, and you know what that's going to mean when you get back to Pakistan. Most of the arrested young men are students who have connections to a province in Pakistan noted for Sunni extremism. Now, um, that's kind of like saying if you were arrested tonight here, you have connections to somebody who plays hockey. Um, because Pakistan is a country of 100 million people. And to say you come from a province where some people have connections, but that's how they went after these guys. Almost all of them were studying in what can only be called a dilatory manner. 
I'm not sure how many of you ever went to university. I certainly didn't. But um, I know that for a lot of students who do, uh, you see them out here uh, in, in bars and taverns on, on a Monday night and not studying. But nonetheless, if you're an Arab student and you study in a dilatory manner, you are an enemy. One of the 19 men once shared an apartment with a man who was not arrested, who was once offered a job by a relief foundation allegedly linked to terrorism. That's how desperate we are to create an enemy. Most lived with other male students in apartments characterized by a minimal standard of living and very little furniture. Anybody ever seen student housing in Canada? <laughs> Some of them knew two people who were not arrested, who once tried to go for a walk on the beach at the Pickering Nuclear Power Plant at 4.15 a.m. on a cool, damp morning in April. Like, you start cueing that Arabic music that you see on these documentaries, because Arabs can't walk unless there's a beautiful music playing in the background, because they're so mysterious as human beings. Some new people that, quote, have access to perfectly legal nuclear gauges commonly used in construction. One of them once lived in an apartment that had pictures of guns on the walls. And my favorite, one of the men once shared an apartment with a man who once shared an apartment with another man who was once associated with a third man who once lived in an apartment with another man that had a picture of airplane schematics on the wall. Now, there's a few degrees of separation. We've got to grant them that. But these are Canada's enemies. And in the same way that the guys who were talking about in the 1940s, we need to create an enemy to justify all of this war spending, in the same way that the Israelis need the Palestinians as this image of the enemy, especially with the spooky music. Um, in the same way that indigenous people are seen as an enemy now, in the same way that the Trudeau government refuses to say those three key words for the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights, free, prior, and informed consent. The day you hear them say that, I'll believe that there's a real change in Ottawa. Until then, it's all BS. I'm going to end my talk, which is normally very depressing, as you can see. Uh, I don't get invited to a lot of parties with it. Just a couple of very brief stories uh, that are positive. Um, at the end of May, we are once again protesting at CANSEC, Canada's largest weapons fair. The Israelis go, the Saudis go, the Emirates are there. All the tortures of the world come and get the tools of repression, terror, and torture. And, and you can go too, uh, except for you're not allowed in. However, we bring the faces of war. Uh, to the entrance of this weapons show. And Homes Not Bombs has a long history of going to the weapons factories of, of Canada. And in fact, when you were talking about uh, the bombing of the hospitals and, and the way there's this massive surveillance constantly, the drones that are flying above Palestine, uh, the cameras for a lot of those drones are built just down the QEW in a place called Burlington. Again, some of my fellow arrestees are here tonight. We have been arrested at Westcam, L3 Communications. Uh, they build the targeting devices in Burlington, Ontario. That's a heart of drone warfare. And one of the really nice things about doing this work and being very open about it and sharing our contact information is a couple of years ago, I got an email from one of the employees who worked there. Um, he quit his job because of us. And he quit his job because he said, I actually took the time to read one of your flyers. And he says, you know what? I am concerned, I guess, about what goes on in Colombia, and I'm concerned about Pakistan and Afghanistan. He says, but the thing that really pisses me off is the Israeli occupation of Palestine. And when I found out that we are producing stuff for that occupation, I left. I hightailed it down there. He said, don't share this because I need to get work elsewhere in the industry. But, you know, so we do have an effect. And I have a quote from an old magazine. Uh, the, the predecessor to CANSEC is a weapon show called Armex. And we chased it out of Ottawa. And it no longer existed for a number of years, uh, simply because hundreds of us went to jail uh, for a few days uh, in, in, in the spring of 1989. And in the journal of the uh, aerospace and war industry, they, they admitted that we had won and that this could never happen again. And so they have been trying ever since to establish this, this industry. During Iraq War I in 1991, 
uh, we had a problem in this country. The same problem that we have today. We have a media that does not tell the truth about war. And we have a pact of forgetting. So when wars happen, whether it's 1991 or whether it's after 2001 when we invade Afghanistan, the media just gets around it because they all want to be like Walter Cronkite during World War II, which was the quote unquote good war. But how can it be a good war when 60 million people die? Um, Frank Scholler is here tonight. He didn't see it as a good war. He refused to fight in it. Why? Because why do we kill people who kill people to prove that killing people is wrong? And the fact that, as A.J. Musty, the great American pacifist, asked, well, wh what happens when somebody wins? How do, you, how do you restrain them? How do you teach them that violence is not the answer? In 1991, um, there was a real attack against hope. And there was a real sense of despair in the peace movement in this country. I'm not sure how many of you remember that. Um, because all through the 80s, we had tried to stop the production of cruise missiles. The first cruise missiles ever used against human beings were used against the children of Baghdad. In 1991, over 50% of the population of Iraq was under the age of 16. So we were waging a war, as we always wage, as in Gaza, uh, against children. And we have a war in this country against children. It's the war of inequality. It's the war against indigenous children. And at that time, we were wondering, why aren't we seeing the victims? All we saw was a video game war. And so a group of us went to some nurse friends of ours, and they took our blood, uh, our human blood, out of our arms one night. And the next morning, we went to Lytton, and we jumped the fence, and Frank, you were there, I remember, um, and we threw our blood on the windows of the management building of Lytton. And 1991 was a very scary time for a lot of people, especially if you were Arab or Muslim, because CSIS was knocking on people's doors. Uh, they assumed that if you were Arabic, you must be Iraqi, which means you knew Saddam Hussein, because that's how we find enemies in Canada. And so I remember we, we got through the line of the police and the horses, and we got our blood, and it was dripping down. And as we were leaving, you know, you kind of get a gallows humor sometimes in the middle of a war. And we were thinking, you know what? What if Saddam Hussein finds out about this and makes us into heroes? Then we're really going to be cooked. You know, this is like free the Canadian 13, says Hussein. They're going to beat the crap out of us in jail. So we got to jail. Uh, we were taken to Metro West Detention Center. And as we were brought in, uh, we were all white. And the guard showed us pictures of black people. And they said, uh, you're all going to spend the night in cells with these guys. Don't mention that you were peace protesters, because they'll beat the crap out of you. And so it had been a very long day, and we were very tired. We're like, don't give us this racist garbage. We, they put us in the cell, and there we are. And I'm sitting there in a cell, and there's three black guys. There's two uh, on the bunks. There's one underneath the bunk, and I'm the fourth guy in a cell built for two. I get to sleep with my head next to the toilet. And so they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them. And inevitably, they ask that question that always gets asked in jail, because you don't want to spend the night in jail with the axe murderer. What'd you do? Um, and so in the back of my mind, I hear the guards saying, don't tell them that you're peace protesters, because they hate them. They'll eat you alive. So I said, we threw our blood on Lytton today. Uh, and they're like, oh, good for you. Yeah, yeah, we, we saw that on the news tonight. That, that, that's, that's, that's fantastic. So, you know, we talked about this, we talked about the racism of the war, and around 3 o'clock that night, uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, um, I started hearing this chanting in the jail. Cha, cha, pa, pa, da, da, da. cha, cha, cha. It was bouncing off the walls. It was a remarkable, beautiful sound. And the guys in my cell were doing it. It was kind of like this call and answer thing that you would see in a Baptist church. I didn't know what it was. So when they stopped chanting in my cell, I said to one of the guys, I said, that was really... What are you guys doing? He says, we're praying. We're Rastafarians. So you're, on the, you're on the range with the Rastas. And so I said, well, that's really beautiful. I said, what are you praying about? And they said, well, we prayed about this. And he prayed about that. And he said, tonight we prayed for you guys. And my heart just melted because I just thought, we're going to be out in a couple days. You guys have been in here for three weeks, six months, immigration holds, because you don't share this white skin privilege that I've got. But it was such a gift to receive that and to carry that with me when I left. And when we got out of jail, the CBC was there. And they said, uh, we have a question for you. What's the question? Did you know that every hour on the hour that you guys were in jail for the last couple of days, you were one of the top news stories in Baghdad? <laughs> and we thought, wow. <laughs> and I thought, that's what human solidarity is about. 
we're these little groups of people wandering around the planet trying to do good, trying to document what's going on in Gaza, trying to do Christian peacemaker teamwork, blockading arms factories, and you wonder, are we making a difference? And at that moment I thought, someone in a bomb shelter somewhere in Baghdad listening to the bombs fall above is listening to somebody out there cares. Somebody out there cares enough to give up just a tiny, it's nothing, little bit of their freedom for our lives because we refuse to disappear them in the same way that we should refuse to disappear indigenous people in Perth and across this nation. Three months after this action, we met a nurse in Barrie and we were organizing for the next stage of Armex 1991, which we canceled. And the nurse came up to us and said, are you the guys that did the Lytton thing? She said, yeah. And she says, oh, that's interesting. She says, I want to tell you about a patient I had. I can't tell you his name for confidentiality, but I had a patient who was dying. He was literally rotting away inside. We couldn't figure out what was wrong with him, but suddenly he started to get better. And as I talked to him, he talked to me about what he did for a living. He used to design some of the electronics that went into the cruise missile at Lytton. And he didn't know what was wrong with himself, until one day some crazy-ass hippies showed up and threw their blood on his window. And it struck him for the first time that this is why he had been divided against the best part of himself. He didn't recognize his connection to what the ultimate result of his work was. It's bloodshed. And when he saw that, he realized why he was so sick at heart because of what he was doing. He knew something was wrong. He couldn't make that connection. And he made that connection and he left. He left Lytton. And he went out to Alberta to open up a daycare. He didn't have a great political sense, but nonetheless, that's what he did. And so we're not going to change this system overnight. But I think being at events like this one tonight, meeting one another, hearing these stories, seeing the pictures, being able to visualize what it looks like in Gaza, going up after this event or sometime later to the INAC offices, joining us at CANSEC at the end of May in Ottawa, or going to your local weapons manufacturer, because God knows there's plenty of them right here in Toronto and in Burlington and in various other places. It takes so little to scare them. We see that in the Trilateral Commission, and that's the reason why they're so secretive, and that's why, the reason why they spy on us so much. We shouldn't be afraid of them. Because why do they do this? They're afraid of us and another outbreak of an excess of democracy. So let's promote that excess of democracy. And if it scares the hell out of them, well, I'm sorry about that, but maybe they'll come over. And because we believe in nonviolence, we can sit down, we can talk about it and say, let's just share it all. Let's share it all and let's do it in a way that is good for the planet and that's good for people as well. I've talked way too long. Sorry about that. But uh, what I'm saying very briefly. Um, I, I was going to talk about the military and climate change, and I'll, I'll present a, a few um, framing ideas about it, but I want to say that, um, you know, you've both talked about people, and I think that's the, the critical thing. Um, uh, I'm reminded, the, you know, as you talked about the prison story, too, about the, you know, what is happening in prisons, you know, and the wonderfully cooperative and brave things that prisoners are doing now mm -hmm. and all over, you know. And it, it uh, so contradicts the, the psychological framework of the uh, mentality of behaviorism, you know, which comes from like ideas like the prisoner's dilemma, <laughs> mm -hmm. ironically enough, you know, and, and uh, games theory and systems theory and so on which fits in very very much with, with these systems, you know, the military system, um, the projections about how to handle climate change and so on. And uh, so uh, thank you for, for bringing, bringing people so centrally into this. And I think that that's my, been my difficulty with the climate movement overall is that um, you know, it still seems shaped by uh, an idea as if people can't think about the people. Mm. You know, that, that uh, I think it was in maybe 2009, around the Copenhagen climate talks, 
I think it was that, but you know, the Oxfam and the Global Humanitarian Forum um, published information that already 300,000 people a year were dying for climate-related causes, and yet, and yet, the climate movement does not talk about about people. You know, we're still. Yesterday, there was a, a David Suzuki article about butterflies, and we're still talking about polar bears and so on. But it's really about people and the threat, really, of extinction, just as nuclear war is. And that that's what's, you know, so incredibly alarming. Um, and uh, how, how the military fits in with this is, is in multiple ways. One is certainly, you know, in the military mentality in the sense of, of dehumanizing people, which, which, of course, is what the economic system does by putting a cost on life, by, by considering people collateral, um, by disregarding, you know, um, huge populations, including young soldiers, you know, civilians, but also, you know, how, how do people, um, you know, ask young men to sacrifice their, their lives, you know, even if they survive, you know, to get, to be so distorted in their psychological development that they have to, you know, obey orders and be killers and so on. Um, so anyway, I've, I've been, uh, also in, in uh, 2009, um, Sarah Flounders, who we had up here a few years ago, um, wrote a, uh, an article that was considered the best article, of, you know, the, the most censored articles of, of the year um, by the group of journalists who look at what doesn't get in the news. And she had written an, a really brilliant article. I think it was The Elephant in the Room, but anyway, you can look it up. Um, but she said that was observing the Copenhagen climate meetings that of the 20,000, 30,000 delegates there, 20,000, and the 100,000 people in the street that nobody talked about the military, you know, which is the main, the primary, uh, the, the, the most greenhouse emitting um, sector of, of the economy. And that continues, you know, even though she wrote this remarkable article, there's hardly any mention, it wasn't, it's not on the 350 um, website, it wasn't in Cochabamba declaration, it's not in the Leap Manifesto, and Naomi Klein really hardly talked about it in her, in her book, you know, which is, you know, otherwise very praiseworthy. But, you know, there's, there's just enormous gaps in the way that, that um, I think, in the understanding of what the system, you know, brings. And, um, uh, you know, a real deception in, in language. I think you've talked about the deception, you know, the hypocrisy. Um, just. I, I, um, interestingly, so, um, today I received my copy of uh, Richard Sanders' um, latest publication. He's the Coalition of the Post of the Arms Trade. And he seemed to have stopped writing for a while. He, we had him up here for a few years ago um, for the Global Day of Action Against Military Spending. And what, his, what he said was that he felt, that's right, here it is. Yeah, that the central thing, you know, that, that uh, perpetuates this, the system is, are the good people, you know, um, by not, not realizing the evil things, you know, the hypocritical things. And indeed, you know, the first title of his article here is The Canada Syndrome, A Captivating Mass Psychosis. Um, and, uh, you, you know, there's so much, you know, as I as I studied the military and the whole system, the sociological aspects too. There's there's so many words I'm, I'm sure that many of you are aware of them that have, have come to have such a deceptive meaning. You know, like responsibility to protect. Um, you know, that was a, that was um, uh, conceived by Gareth Evans, uh, an Australian who was one of the architects of the East Timor Gap Treaty, <laughs> actually. You know, so like, these things were, you know, formulated by people who were horrible. <laughs> um, or Marquette Evans, another Evans, but uh, who was a corporate social responsibility person, um, the only the person who was uh, appointed in Ottawa with that, that, in that first role, she came from Barrett Gold. You know, so this is, she has the corporate responsibility office for the federal government. So there's so much, you 
you know, in the language that's, that's utterly deceptive, and you simply find that very centrally um, with the military. Now, the um, security, you know, the, the idea of security is, is uh, you know, it's really military, um, military security. Again, um, if you look at the literature on sustainability, it's, you know, it's the same thing. It's a very, it's become very, uh, it has a very perverted meaning to mean actually opposite of, of what it's, it's supposed to mean, like, you know, if you look something like, look at the literature on food. Um, sustainability, what you really want to look at is the sovereignty <laughs> literature, you know, to really get, you know, why it was really real. Anyway, um, so I just wanted to say a few things about Lyme, just to, and military, just to orient you, following up on the Sarah Flanders, there's actually been very little that's written about it, um, so I just wanted to mention, I wrote two articles, one is going up on the Science for Peace website soon, you can, uh, so there's links on that to some of the really good articles, and I also wrote something that's on the Canadian Dimension website, but, so there's also some links. But there's a, a book by Barry Sanders who looked at the, uh, called The Green Zone on the, the military missions. And I'll, I'll read you a little bit from his findings. Um, so that's, that's one source. Um, Tamara Lorry um, is also written. She's connected with Voice Women as well as Global, um, Bruce Daniels with Global Network Against Weapons in Space. Um, uh, there's also a new, really excellent book, which is really unique. It's called The Secure and the Dispossessed, How the Military and Corporations are Shaping Climate Change, uh, uh, climate change World. And it's the broadest, the broadest um, approach to it. Because um, it, covers, it covers the security apparatus, which these other works don't do. The other works may look at the direct emissions, greenhouse gas emissions of the military. Um, there's other areas that have not been covered sufficiently, as, you know, as far as I've seen in the literature, um, including the destruction of carbon sinks, um, like the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, and, and the Iraq-Kuwait war destroyed 50% of the soil, topsoil, in Kuwait. And not to mention all the depleted uranium in Iraq, but uh, soil is a, is a primary carbon sink. There's the defoliation from you know the the U.S. U.N. wars yeah, in in um, Korea um, and then certainly Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, just you know again totally destroying forests. You mentioned children. Um, uh, Mambio, George Mambio wrote a very fine article during the time of the, of the uh, Paris um, COP meetings that. Uh, the, about the forest fires, they called it the, uh, the uh, I think it was the apocalypse, uh, the worst 20th uh, of this century so far, uh, the climate apocalypse. It was about the burning of uh, tropical rainforests in Indonesia. Um, many of these forests are burned for, um, to, so that they can um, grow fossil fuels, which get carbon credits. <laughs> And, uh, but it had created, you know, just, you know, besides again, destroying a you know, carbon sink, you know, creates a medical pollution. And he remarked that the last time this happened, 15,000 children had died in Indonesia, you know, from the forest fires. And he said that this time is worse. So these are stories that are, you know, we're never heard about. Now, in terms of the military, so there's, there's I, I wanted to make the, the direct emissions. Um, um, it's, uh, I have to mention that when I, I wrote the article for, it's in the Canadian Dimension on the, on the website, I compared it to the Israeli situation. I talk, I, I called it the, something about the uh, climate change is, is, has been put in formaldehyde, the process, progress, you know, has been put in formaldehyde. And that was, a, that was a, um, um, a tactic that is used, was used in Israel um, to put the peace process in formaldehyde. So you go through the motions, you sound good, but you're actually, you know, you're not doing anything, in fact, you're going backwards. And in fact, that's what's happened with climate. The, the temperature, the uh, rise in temperature has, has accelerated, as well as the concentration of greenhouse gas emissions has accelerated. Well, the thing about the military is that it's exempt under Kyoto, as well as international aviation and shipping. And of course, Shipping and aviation are very intrinsic too to the military as well as the whole 
economy, the neoliberal economy, trade and trade agreements. But these are exempt. So when people talk about emissions going down, they're not counting huge sectors of the economy. Um, so that's one, one huge distortion. Um, but it's also, I, I had remarked that it's, it's similar to the formaldehyde Israel situation because, uh, because of the use of, of what's called, uh, you know, by, I think, it came, again, came from Halper and another a very fine Israeli academic, but talking about lawfare, you know, where you really distort the meaning of law, you know, um, in order to justify, you know, that's, that's uh, so Israel is able to scroll out of saying that they occupy Gaza by calling it a parastatal entity or something like that. But the same thing certainly has happened with the you know law around around climate and emissions and so on. Also, um, you know, there's no regulatory body. I think there's no oversight to actually implement you know international law like the Geneva Conventions and the, and the climate agreements and so on. Um, so just to get an idea of the, uh, um, are, are, are you aware of the emissions of any of the military, uh, you know, the bombers and the shipping and all that? Um, I, I don't know if I should go into this. I mean, they're so shocking, you know, when we talk about um, reducing, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, you know, by these you know, ridiculous efforts like hybrid cars while not paying anything for public transportation. You know, it's just so disgusting. Anyway, um, just for uh, uh, just because I don't want to take the time right now, maybe the discussion I can give some examples. But I also wanted to touch on um, on the, uh, the the fact that the NATO, the Pentagon, uh, the U.S. Army, and the Navy have defined. Uh, climate as, as, uh, as a major threat multiplier now. It's not terrorism, you know, and it's certainly not communism, but it's, it's climate. And, and the fact, the idea, which is a very Malthusian idea, um, uh, some, sometimes coming from the, the um, population people, like um, Paul Ehrlich and, and Garrett Hardin, the, the tragedy of the commons, you know that that people are nasty, rich, and short. Their life is, and that and that you know if they become impoverished um, and threatened, that they're just going to want what we have and invade our borders. So you know, of course, they're using all the Israeli technology you know, for controlling borders. Walls are going up. And hopefully, it'll come down. But this is this is the mentality around uh, you know NATO. The Army and the Navy that you know seeing, seeing climate as a major threat multiplier, but it also it also justifies you know what they're doing like like um, like the militarization of the Arctic, um, which we certainly saw very much under Harbor, you know, um, and and that continues. I think I I wanted uh, there's one thing that you brought up like which is the uh, the um, climate refugees. Um, you know, invading <laughs> Europe, I suppose. Um, and a lot of that, you know, if you look really carefully at what's actually happened, is that it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's so much more complicated than that. The, the, the um, you know, the, the situation in Sudan and Syria and Egypt and Tunisia have been attributed to the Arab Spring, you know, to the, the, to the drought. However, the drought occurred earlier. Than, than this. And there were many other factors, like the rise in food prices um, were largely due to three other factors. One, well, two, but to biofuels. The U.S. had claimed that biofuels were um, um, only responsible for 3% rise in, in food prices, but there was a suppressed World Bank report that said that it was, uh, it was responsible for 75% of the rise in food prices. The other factor was the, um, you know, the uh, commodity, putting food um, essentials on the commodity market. This was the Goldman Sachs um, uh, index. And there was a, if you want to see it, there was an article in Harper's a couple years ago about the food bubble in Goldman Sachs. Anyway, so those are 
Those are the main factors around the rise in food prices. In Syria in particular, there was recently um, an, uh, a study from Columbia University which again claimed that, that, you know, that the um, drought caused these, you know, it was a primary cause for the civil war in Syria because of food shortages and so on. But what happened was that the Syrian regime, regime had become more and more neoliberal and that, that what had happened like at, at the exact time was that they stopped subsidizing fertilizers and um, not seeds, it was something, something, but they stopped, they stopped their subsidies. So that led to farmers having to um, leave. Now the article from Columbia University said that there was something like 1.5 million people, uh, internal migration, but it wasn't that. It was more like 250,000 probably at the most. So, so again, there's many, many other factors, but ne nevertheless, what's being conveyed in, in the popular imagination, uncritically, is that you know, climate change you know, is going to cause anarchy <laughs> and, and war. But it, and it's, of course, what's really neglected is who, who, is, who are the people who are really violent. You know, like the military has, has been put in charge, like this is part of the, the militarization of climate change, that the military has been put in charge of security, supposedly in the, you know, as if they're there to protect people, that they're going to be the rescuers and so on and so forth. Um, one only has to look at what happened in, in um, Haiti, in Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, um, and the tsunami that the uh, military, you know, did not protect, and, and uh, or the Central African Republic, you know, is it far worse that the military has, has uh, you know, upheld and protected the wealthy and property and, uh, and um, attacks the poor people. There were, there were, of course, the reports, the eyewitness reports from um, Amy Goodman during the Haiti earthquake of, you know, the runway um, in um, Port-au-Prince, you know, that uh, there were boxes and boxes of water, bottles of water, but they were for the military, and that was preventing medical, you know, medical help from, from landing. Um, so, so anyway, this is part of the, the framing, I think, that, that, you know, one has to be very, very concerned about. But, but very centrally, you know, until, until these issues are linked and people have more awareness of, of the centrality of the military in, in all these issues in policing and, and you know, uh, in jails and in um, surveillance in, in the uh, entire, in, in the economy. Um, you know, there's, and again, there's excellent work on it, but, but very much in climate change that, that the, these issues have to be linked. There's a, um, another book, I, I think Christian Parenti spoke here recently, I wasn't able to go, but I, I looked at his book too. Um, and, he, and he talks in his book, you know, again, like some, he somewhat leaves out some of these facts about, you know, um, about the causes of, of poverty and migration and so on, but he does a, he looks carefully at, at the effect of NAFTA, for instance, on Mexico. And at the end of the book, he um, says that, which I think is the other thing I want to interject here, is that climate change really presents a very different kind of a problem. Um, uh, and this is how he differs, I think, from, I think, some of the problematic things about the idea about claiming, uh, changing the system, you know, is that climate change is really urgent, you know, that it does mean hundreds and thousands of deaths. Uh, it's going to, you know, uh, um, you know, whole areas, it's inevitable. Whole areas are going to have to be, you know, uh, you know, millions of people will have to be relocated. I mean, it's inevitable, sea level rise is inevitable. You, you know, um, uh, the flooding is, is inevitable. So, so, you know, the framing of the environmental movement is so far from really uh, addressing the magnitude of, of this problem, the urgency. What, what Parenti says at the end of the book is that, you know, you, you can't wait for, for an ideal society. Um, you can't wait for socialism, you know, um, transition towns, all that kind of stuff. The this, this specific problem around climate really has to, has to be addressed. 
And included in that is eliminating the military. You know, it's been done before. That was the goal, it seems to me, of the UN. And yet it seems really taboo almost to, to talk about it. I think there's a horrible, a horrible um, column by Robin Sears that called far less, you know, a fairy tale. Well, the fairy tale is that you don't have to do any of this. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop here. And I can supply examples of, and numbers if you're, if you're interested. So anyway, thank you very much. Also, <laughs> I'm going to pass around.